Ah. And um, okay, I think we can we can start the official part of the talk. Which is official? What's official? Are you going to ask me questions or what? What's the Something deal? like that. Yes, yes, okay. yes. Uh, so uh, tell me for for us who are following your work. Um, what are you doing in, in this uh, um, in these days? Are you drawing something new? Uh, I I know that uh, you published your uh, uh, dream diary some some times yeah. ago. Quite a while ago, uh, about a year ago or something. Uh huh. Yeah. I don't Have know if it's sold real big. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny since that book's been published. And actually, since I, since I gave it to those guys to publish, uh, I haven't been able to remember my dreams as well. My subconscious is not letting me remember the dreams because it, I suspect the subconscious does not want to be exposed that way. The subconscious had its own agenda, its own... I, you know, idea about things, and it doesn't want you telling the world what's going on in it. <laughs> it doesn't want that. It doesn't like that. I really believe that. I, it's not letting me remember my dreams. I wake up and I forget them right away, almost all the time. Sometimes I remember, but most of the time I can't remember them anymore. It's funny, when I was doing that, recording my dreams, it became easier to remember them and they, I remember them very vividly and then that would actually affect the dreams and the dreams became more vivid as just focusing on the dreams and writing them down like that. But writing them down for yourself is one thing, but then telling the world, subconscious doesn't like that, doesn't want you to do that. <laughs> Not sure why, I don't know. who knows what the subconscious wants, I don't know. <laughs> so in this book you you recorded actually one part of your life uh, which was happening in a dream life dream life yeah yeah it's kind of embarrassing to read it because you see these repetitions you know that you wouldn't recognize unless you had a recorded them regularly and then go back and read it so these things keep coming up these like certain kind of sexual fixations and stuff keep coming up oh my god it's embarrassing <laughs> but are, are you working on something new right now some illustration or a comic or something like that uh no i just do i've just been doing a series of small jobs for people i haven't done i haven't done any big projects at all since genesis basically but and it was a while aileen and i were doing uh some collaborative comic strips we kind of <clears throat> run out of places to publish them. I don't know. I can't publish in the New Yorker anymore. And uh, like I told you, the last strip we did about Trump was, has only been published online by the New York Review of Books. It, it's only on, in the electronic media. It's not on paper anywhere. It's too bad. I, I don't like to read comics online. <laughs> I don't see it on paper. I don't know. But uh, you that. did the, a comic... Uh... You did a comic about Trump all the way in the 1980s, I think, or something like I that. I did. Yeah, I did it in 1988 or 89, after, after reading his book, Art of the Deal, The Art of the Deal, that he wrote. He came across that book as so obnoxious and arrogant. That, and also, I had been reading newspaper articles about how he handled him and his father, this, the real estate empire that they had around New York. And... So there's lots of articles in, in kind of left-wing newspapers and magazines talking about how ruthless they were about taking over these buildings and, and forcing out the tenants because they wanted to raise the value and up, upgrade the buildings and stuff like that. It's not, not nice, not nice guys at all. So, yeah, I did that strip <clears throat> where I... I kind of have my, I have these two like powerful feminine females that are kind of my henchmen and they bring him in and I, I give him a big lecture about what a bad boy he's been. And then at the end, I have the two girls give him a swirly. They dump, put, 
put his head in a toilet flush it. It's called a swirly. <laughs> And anyway, nothing happened about that except till Trump decided to run for president in 2015. Then a journalist came to see me, who was sent by the New York Observer. And he wrote a very nasty article about me. Very, na very nasty article. And it was run in the New York Observer in, the, at the, in early 2016 or late 2015. And then I found out that the New York Observer at that time was owned by Trump's son-in-law, Jared Kushner. He owned that newspaper. And the editor, Ken Kirsten, was an old friend of his. And they sent this nasty guy. I don't, I don't think the guy was even a professional journalist. I don't know what he was. But I think it's possible, it's just speculation, that someone had showed that comic I did in 1989 about Trump to Jared Kushner. And Jared's known as a get even kind of guy. We'll get this guy. We'll, we'll, we'll smear crumb, you know. I think that might have been what was going on there. I don't know. I'm not sure. But it was the nastiest encounter I've ever had with the, with the journalists. It was, it was very strange, very weird. Yes. I don't know. And tell me, you, you are somehow one of the people who shaped the, the way that uh, American culture was observed or criticized or uh, contemplated or whatever. Uh, and at the same time, you, you, were, uh, you were living in the south of France in Sauve for how much, like 30 years or something? Almost 30 years. It would be, uh, yeah, be 30 years in April. Mm -hmm. yeah, what can you say about this move to, to the south of France? Uh, now, when you look back, was it, uh, was it a good choice? Did you enjoy that kind of life in a small place in Europe? What's your opinion? I have two minds about it. It's a really nice place to live, as everybody knows. You know, they can't, couldn't find a nicer place probably than, than here is for ordinary life if you're not you know, filthy rich and can't afford your own island, you know, this is pretty good, pretty nice here. And, uh, but then, and so in that way, yeah, it's, you know, it's fine. But in this other way, I think that my role in the world as a commentator on America is, you know, I, I, it always kind of bothered me that I was pulled out or that I left America and so I, I can't directly comment on what goes on there now. Not as when I lived in America, I was constantly reacting to to the culture around me, mostly in a negative way. Most of like where I lived in California and all that is constant in the eighties, seventies, and eighties. You know, it was always I was always reacting to it. But living here, the re my reaction to America is completely secondary. So I can't. I don't have that immediate emotional, you know, friction with the country anymore. So it, I can't reflect that in my work quite as as uh, sharply as I did back then. And I don't know. Maybe that's maybe it doesn't matter. I don't know. I'm not sure about that. So it's a while. It's a really pleasant place to live here in, in South of France. My role as as an artist, I'm not sure if I was, you know. Uh, a good thing for me to abandon America. I don't know, I'm not sure. I don't know. Uh, and uh, what do you do in your religion in so uh, Do you walk around? Uh, what is your experience of the place? What well, do you do in your free time? Well, we're in this little village that's in this very kind of rugged, rocky countryside, you know, the, and I spend a lot of time just just like a two minute walk in that direction and you're in this wilderness, this rocky, scrubby wilderness that's, and there's these ancient pathways through there. It's really a deep place and it just goes on and on for miles. This goes on and on. So I, I used to spend a lot of time up there exploring. It was very, very interesting. I, I got so attached to it, I kind of had to stop going up there. I haven't been up there for a long time. I used to go up there all the time. I used to sometimes even 
few times stayed overnight in these old abandoned little stone huts and stuff that are up there. And stayed overnight a few times. It was a very interesting experience by myself. <laughs> but it, you know, for that, or just for walking around, you can't you can't beat it. The, the old villages are beautiful. These ancient stone houses. It's you know, it's really nice. And coming from California, where that was in a constant state of real estate development, it kept changing and changing all the time. It moved to a small town, and in ten years, there's it so much development and housing built it completely changed the place. And so I was worried about that here. It was so nice here that I was worried when we first came here that it was all going to change in ten years. But it hasn't. It hasn't changed that much. It hasn't developed that much. You know, they kind of you know paved the roads a little more and done stuff like that, sort of some modern improvements like that. But in general, it's pretty much the same, you know, pretty much. Yeah. More outsiders here than there used to, than there was 30 years ago, more people from different places. It used to be much more provincial and, and you know, this old generation of people that had were adults in World War II when I first came here, they're all gone, they all died. But they were interesting. That that generation was real interesting to see and to observe. But now they're all gone. But. And how many people live uh, in in so? Uh, how, how many? About, I think it's about four thousand people, something like that. And now there's the old village on this side of the river. It's all the old ancient houses, and then then the mountain the the hill starts right there with its rocky uh, hillside. And then on the other side of the river, there's a, the main road. And then beyond that, there's this new kind of suburb that's been developing over there. But it doesn't develop rapidly. It's like one, one house at a time, you know. But a lot of the people that grew up around here, that they grew up in the old village, aspired to live over there where there's more sunlight and you can have a what they call a villa, you know, a small modest house that has a garden around it and you know, it's a single house by itself. Whereas here in the old part, all the houses are all clustered together. It's, it's kind of almost like a fortress. There's this big wall that comes up from the river and then these, all these houses clustered inside this little tight little area. And the houses are tall and narrow with stairways and, and it's, but that gives it a kind of insulated, coziness to me that's like a living inside a fortress. <laughs> I like that. I like that about so. Yeah. <clears throat> and uh, I also wanted to ask, ask you about the topic, which is uh, really a hot topic these days. It's uh, COVID-19. And uh, yeah. <laughs> I <your> first... Uh, <laughs> yeah, maybe we are all contaminated or something. But uh, um, I wanted something to, I wanted first to, to tell my story about uh, how it all started. Yeah. It's, uh, um, I was uh, at the beginning of the, of the uh, COVID uh, uh, thing. I was in Berlin, in, in Germany, uh, yeah. and uh, there was uh, the projection of, of the film, um, the, the Final Adventure of Cactus Kid. And uh, you know how it goes in, in, in Germany. It was all carefully projected maybe one year ago, but uh, nobody was expecting that uh, in March uh, uh, 2020 there is going to be uh, uh, something like a, a COVID uh, a craze or something. <laughs> so I was there and uh, at, I was there when everything started to close down. Uh, the museum where my exhibition was as well was uh, closing and uh, everything, yeah. Was, uh, yeah. everything was just uh, a, a kind of uh, getting uh, um, locked down. Yeah. And it was the start. Uh, people just didn't know what was it all about or how is it going to develop. Right. And, uh, while I was uh, trying to, to come back to, to, to Serbia, yeah. was, uh, uh, I had the, the, the ticket... Uh, from Berlin, air ticket from Berlin to, to Belgrade. Yeah. But, um, the, the and uh, I went inside the plane, 
and the plane was uh, rolling down the, the, the road and it stopped at some moment and they said uh, maybe we are going to have some problems and uh, uh, we are waiting for the um, if, if we could uh, be uh, allowed to take off. Really? Yeah. It was going down the runway and, the, and they stopped oh, it? Yes. Wow. yes. Wow. Then we were waiting for about one hour and uh, after that they said that uh, we have to return to the Berlin airport. Oh my God, Jesus Christ. <laughs> it, was pretty, it was pretty nerve wracking also because uh, uh, we found out that uh, most of the flights were getting canceled. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I, I, had, I was lucky to have uh, friends um, in Berlin, uh, as, <clears throat> especially Beate Wild, who, who was the who was the curator of this exhibition in the Museum of uh, European Cultures. Yeah. And, uh, she came and she was able to, to pay uh, the bigger part, uh, part of it was paid by myself, but she paid for the bigger part of the, of the ticket. And uh, you know, I don't, I, don't have a, I, don't have, I don't use a plastic money, I don't have credit cards. So it was uh, very complicated to, to actually buy uh, an expensive ticket. But at, at that moment, I also realized that the whole thing uh, was actually projected uh, uh, in the rich countries because uh, the people who are coming from, for example, from Western Europe or from the States or anywhere, yeah. they, they can manage to, to pay a very expensive ticket or to stay in, in the hotels in this yeah. case of yeah. emergency. But right. uh, for, for the small guy from the Balkans, it was really like a nightmare. Yeah. So I bought the ticket. I was able to, to find the, 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 line, the, the, the only existing uh, flight, which was uh, from, from Frankfurt. So oh. I, I, I had to go from Berlin to Frankfurt. Yeah. I didn't know if the, if the plane, if, if the flight is going to be canceled again. Yeah, so right. I started to, to make plans to perhaps to go to Munich because uh, Munich is the place uh, with a lot of Balkan people mm -hmm. and then to get uh, through the uh, some kind of half legal ways to go back to Serbia. Is there a train? Uh, I was planning to take a train but yeah. I, was lucky that, I was lucky that the, the flight was eventually was not cancelled no. so I arrived to Serbia but I was lucky because I had friends, uh, yeah. uh, you know, uh, many of the people uh, from, from several Balkan countries, yeah. they were like stuck in the airports for days and some of them... Right, they, yeah, really? Yeah. Wow, wow. And so it was... What it day was, was that? What was the date? It was, uh, I think, something like uh, uh, March 16th or something like that. That's very interesting because at the exact same time, Aileen and I were in Paris, about to go to Los Angeles, the United States, for an art opening of Aileen's work in a gallery in Los Angeles. Hmm. And we were at the airport hotel, staying one night at the hotel, and we we're going to fly out the next morning. And we, I get a, she gets a message on her iPhone from my nephew in Los Angeles who says that, oh, Trump's going to stop all flights from Europe and blah, 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 blah. And, and so we went to the airport the next day and canceled our flight to the United States. They wouldn't give us our money back. We never got our money back from that airline. So then we went back into Paris and uh, stayed there for a couple of days and, and they locked the whole country down while we were in Paris. Mm. So we, we managed to get this train to back down to the south of France on the 17th of March, just a day after they locked down the country. They mm. got out of there just in time out of Paris, back here. And I haven't gone anywhere since. I've been stayed here ever since. I haven't done any traveling at all. I, I kind of liked the, the quiet. I liked the fact that it's just everything quieted down in the spring. It was really nice here. With the, there was no traffic on the roads. It, Everything was very quiet. The nature made a big comeback, you know. There was you could hear the birds singing. It was it was kind of nice. <clears throat> uh, 
you know, at the, at the, at the very start of the, of the COVID-19 craze, I, I read an article by, uh, by Barbara, Barbara Plag is her name. She's uh, an Italian uh, who works on the palliative care. And uh, she- what, is, actually, what does she work on? Uh, she works on uh, palliative care. I, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it. Yeah, good. palliative care, yeah, okay, yeah. yeah so, so she works with the people who are um, very uh, hardly yeah. ill and uh, diseased. Yeah. And uh, she, she wrote an article which was very inspirational because uh, she was uh, saying that uh, she knows uh, what, uh, the, what it is to be in a life danger and uh, how these things go. But uh, uh, at, at the start, uh, it was still quite not sure why this uh, COVID-19 thing was uh, getting so serious and so spread around the world. Yeah. Because uh, it, it was, there was no um, initial indication that it would be so uh, bad. <laughs> right, that's right. And so, you know, uh, for example, I heard uh, just today, they said that uh, about uh, one million and, and a half of the people died of, uh, of uh, uh, COVID-19. Yeah. And, uh, in her alt article, uh, Barbara Plag was... Uh, saying that uh, um, there's uh, about 9 million people who die every year just uh, because the lack of food, you know? <laughs> Malnutrition. <laughs> yes, if you compare these numbers, it's, it's really crazy why it started, yeah. why it uh, yeah. spread so fast, the whole lockdown thing. And I'm curious, what's your opinion on this? I've done a lot of reading about it, a lot of reading. And I, both, you know, stuff that I see on people send me that that appears on the internet, or even I even read some scientific studies, you know, highly technical stuff, which I don't fully understand, but it's revealing, revealing. So the the picture I get is okay. Something something happens in China, and the Chinese government, since it's, it's autocratic. They immediately locked the whole country down, or some huge part of it, like 50 million people or something, they locked down. No, that's it. Everybody stay home. And people, you know, everybody obeys. That's it. You have to in China. And every apartment building in the cities in China has a person there who's like a concierge, but he's also a member of the party, member of the Communist Party, he watches everybody, knows everything that goes on. So nobody can get away with anything in that country. And I remember when it first started, I saw these photos in the newspaper taken in China. This was like in February, where people on the street, there's a guy in a, in a white coat, it's a medical official. He's standing there pointing this thing at him that, that it's like, looks like a gun, but it's a thing testing your temperature. You know, and people just submit to that. They're, they're all got their masks on, they're standing there with this thing pointing at their head, and hold still, you know. And I thought, people are just submit to that. So China set the model for how to do this. So then the World Health Organization is alerted, and they have this, uh, these computer models done by a guy in England. That there's some group, some group in England that does these computer models, and they come up with this very alarming predictions, saying that you know this thing, this this new virus that's on the loose that started in China could kill like such and such numbers of millions of people. Blah blah blah. So then the, the World Health Organization just completely buys that and starts telling other countries they should do like China. And you know what, though? You know, as you know, governments are very happy to have a reason to do that. <laughs> yes, yes. And, the, and the media loves it. It's great for the media. So, they, you know, the rest of us don't stand a chance against these people. You got, first, you got the medical industrial complex. You get governments that are happy to, to introduce social controls. And then you got the media that's only too happy to push the panic button about anything, you know. Mm -hmm. I, I saw an interesting write-up about this. It was done in Germany. And this art, this writer showed two covers of a very popular German magazine, Der Spiegel. One's from 2009 when the, when the swine flu was the big thing. 
and it said something like, worldwide virus. And then here's one from 2020, almost exactly the same, worldwide virus. <laughs> so you know, the media, they just love to throw things like this. I, I, who knows if, it's, if they're actually taking orders from the, the uh, plutocrats who own the, these, the media or what, who knows, or if it's just strictly because pushing the panic button gets people's attention, I don't know. So here we are, and, and you know they've been building up this for a long time. They've been predicting it, talking about it. There was a movie in 2011 called Contagion, which has a scenario that's, that's and they show at the end how the the pandemic started in two, you know this 2011 fiction movie, which is exactly the same as the, the narrative about COVID-19. Comes from a bat. Got, then the, the pigs got sick from the got this disease from the virus from the bats. And then the bat, the pigs are slaughtered, and then pe the people cook it and eat it, and they get the virus from that, and then it spreads to the west. And it's, it's, so I don't know. I, something doesn't add up about it to me, but I don't know what. I don't know what. I don't. There, there, there's an argument that's quite intelligent done by people, scientists, and people who study this thing that. They have not really established this, the existence of this virus to, to some of the satisfaction of a lot of scientists that they have not even established the existence of it. The CDC, which is the powerful American agency, the Center for Disease Control, which has worldwide power, and they put out a thing in July, so somebody quoted an article I read, the CDC saying that, that they, figured out the, the genetic sequence of this, but not from a real virus, if the real virus was not available, they said, to figure out this genetic sequence. And so they kind of uh, did it from, this, from the old SARS virus the, from 2003, and it, I don't know, it's... So then the other argument is that they, they had this, super Frankenstein viruses that they developed in these biosafety labs, level four biosafety laboratories, both in the United States, in France, and in China. That they, why they developed these things, they, they claim it was so they could come up with an antidote because they're so afraid of, of virus epidemics. So they create these super viruses that they, they say was gonna jump from animals to humans. You know, they say this, these, super powerful virus that these bats have was going to jump to humans at some point and then everybody's going to get sick you know from that, from that. so they have to then they say they claim that's why they're creating it they, so they combine this bat virus the SARS thing with the, a normal coronavirus which causes a common cold you know common uh, sy symptoms of cold they combine that in these laboratories so then this then the Somehow, maybe this virus, this super Frankenstein virus, got out of the, the laboratory somehow in Wuhan, escaped from it somehow or other, and got into the general population. That's the other possibility. So either, either there is no super Frankenstein virus, or there is. That's, that's where I, no one, I can. Who knows? Who knows? I don't know. What's really going on? I don't know. I don't know. Yes. Yes. And the interesting thing is that uh, uh, speaking about the predictions of this situation that we have now is that uh, our friend yeah. uh, David Lasky, he did a comic uh, way back in... That's right, yeah, you sent me that. Yeah, it was very interesting. Was... It's very interesting. And uh, he did the, the book, uh, it was called No Ordinary Flu. And uh, it speaks about uh, the, what is going to happen. He did it in collaboration with some of the scientists uh, from the uh, American health institutions, I think. And uh, it speaks about uh, what we should do in the case of the emergence of the new kind of, of flu, new, new right. kind of virus. And did, um, did, did that, what year was that? Yes, yes. It was like 2008 or something like that? 2008. Yes. Hey, that comic, yeah, it was uncanny. It's just very strange. But he so, said that they won't, you told me that he said that they won't reprint it now because they, for some reason or other, I don't know why, I forget what you said. Yeah, it's, it's because uh, 
uh, he compared it to the situation of the Spanish uh, uh, flu in yeah. uh, 1918. Yeah. And uh, back then the situation was different uh, because a lot of young people died. And uh, with, yeah, this yeah. New, with this new pandemic, it's, uh, it's said that uh, it's mostly attacking old people. So they That's eventually right. have uh, uh, um, uh, preserved, uh, uh, they stopped uh, distributing these comics because uh, it could, uh, it could uh, uh, start a panic or something like that. But... Uh, the interesting thing that it was distributed for free in many countries, and uh, I uh, I also had the, the version in in Bosnian, which is the same language like Serbian or Croat. So it was distributed all over the world. Wow! And really, really, wow! I think it, it speaks that this scenario was already there somehow. Yeah. yeah. So it started to happen. People it, people accepted it because it was somewhere. It was in their consciousness or their subconsciousness or, or yeah, yeah it's been, they've been building up to this for a long time building up yeah. to it. there's all kinds of books with these dire predictions of this coming virus pandemic they've been building up and so when they had the the avian flu in 2004 they built that up built panic, panic about that and that one didn't turn out to be much then they had the swine flu in 2009 that one also was a big fizzle. That turned out to be not a big deal either. You know, they made a big panic about it when it was happening, but it turned out it didn't kill that many people. So this time they made it stick. And I think that the, the time is right for it. The time is right. And you know, there's all kinds of guys coming up with these really sophisticated explanations of, of how and why these people at the top of the power, the, the most wealthy, powerful people, would deliberately instigate something like this. I've read all kinds of you know, different ideas about it, and some of them make sense, but who knows? I don't know. You know, and all this stuff about Bill Gates and everything, you know, <laughs> that, you know, with his billions of dollars, and he's put a lot of money, tens of millions of dollars into vaccine research and all that. So the thing that kind of worries me is how hard are they going to push this vaccination once they have it? Okay, at first, they don't have enough to give to the ordinary schlubs that they're giving it mostly in the beginning to. Uh, frontline workers, medical workers, and people like that, and then people that are more seriously in danger of of catching the thing, you know, to give it to them first. So then the, they'll get around to everybody else later, I guess. But I, I don't know. I, it's very unpopular. This idea of forced vaccination or mandatory vaccination is not popular. No, very few people like that idea. You know. So I don't know if they'll actually push it or not. They might be testing the waters, seeing, you know, just by talking about it and see what kind of reaction it gets to see if it's worth trying to push it or not. You know, because there's a lot of money to be made. And that's one thing, you know, the companies that are making this stuff, those pharmaceutical companies have already received billions of dollars just to do the research and development for these vaccines. The American government has given them billions of dollars. These companies Moderna and Pfizer and Merck and uh, Johnson and Johnson, these other big pharmaceutical companies, the big one in France, Sanofi, Roche, the big one in Switzerland, uh, this couple in, in Germany that, you know, major producers of vaccinations. So that's one thing, but then there's also social controls government controls. I mean, but if it comes down to, you know, you have to have this certificate or a card or something saying you've got to receive these vaccinations. Otherwise, you can't get on this airplane. Well, fuck it. I won't get on the airplane. I'll just stay home. I'm not going to get the vaccine. I don't trust that all the stuff I've read about uh, biomedical science and how it operates. I don't trust them. I'm not going to get it. But maybe I shouldn't say that because I might then then they might uh, decide to do a health attack on me. I don't know. <laughs> scary, scary. I don't know. Yeah. And you know, it it gives the people from the government. It brings them into this uh, paternalistic uh, position. Yeah. So that uh, 
they are telling you what you should do or what you shouldn't do. And for them, it's it's really a great position in, in these times yes. when I think uh, the, the, the democratic system is in some sort of a crisis because people, they yeah. less and less believe in their <laughs> politicians. Yeah. Democracy is messy and complicated, you know, and it's kind of hard to get anything done in democracy because you can't get people to agree. But if you just tell them what they're going to do, okay, this is for your own good. Here's what it's going to be like. If you don't like it, just shut the fuck up and get in your house, you know, go in your house. <laughs> get in there. Go on. Get in your house. Where's your paper? We, we, I don't know if you have it in Serbia. Here we have a paper now. If we want to go outside, you have to have this paper saying why you're out there at the time, the date, and it has to be your signature on it. I don't know. Do you have that in Serbia? We don't have it yet, but you know, these small countries, they just imitate what the big countries are doing <laughs> situation. So it will probably be <laughs> days or weeks or something like that. We will have the same thing. Well, we had the paper in, in March and April. They introduced it in March. We had it for something like six weeks back then. Then they took it, they said, okay, now you don't have to have the paper. The lockdown ended in the summer. And then now they introduced it again about, I don't know, two weeks ago or something, this thing. And I don't know, who knows how long that will last. I have no idea. But whether or not yeah. there's really a serious virus even going around? I don't know. I just don't know. I have no idea. I know they yeah. jack up the numbers of the deaths and all that. They, they start calling any, anybody that's, you know, 75 or 80 years old that dies for almost any reason, they can call it a COVID death and put it put on a statistic. So I don't know. Don't know. Yeah, a, a friend of mine from London, he was uh, at the beginning of the epidemic skills, uh, like uh, they had the system where, where you call on the phone, your a medical worker or some some doctor or something and uh, he had uh, something which looked like uh, his body temperature was a little bit higher and so yeah. they he told him you have a covid and you know he was uh, um, they told him he had a covid <laughs> yeah, you know he was just a uh, uh, sign as another guy with the covid 19 but uh, it lasted for a few days and then he was quite okay again but yeah. uh, it was, uh, uh, he, he never knew if it was uh, really uh, a COVID-19 or something else. Yeah. So even these statistics are quite... Uh, uh, yeah. Untrustworthy, yeah. You don't know what the, how accurate they are, how truthful they are. And also the, the test, I don't know what they use there or in your part of the world, but this PCR test, you know what that means, PCR? It, I've read some stuff about that, that it's completely unreliable also. It can't be, can't be relied on. And it was the, it's not meant to be used for diagnostic purposes for finding uh, if you have a virus infection or whatever. It's not meant for that purpose. So I don't know. I don't know. The whole thing is cockamamie. I don't, I don't, I don't know what the, what's really going on. I was uh, asking some people, you know, some really... Uh, every summer I go to the house uh, which uh, my parents have built in the eastern Serbia and uh, it's uh, it's one of the poorest uh, parts of the country but uh, with really beautiful nature yeah. and uh, really great simple people you know who who can uh, uh, get along with almost any any life problem just by their uh, uh, ability to to uh, uh, improvise or to find the solutions by trial and miss and stuff like that. Right. And I was curious, like, what would they say about uh, uh, these mm. uh, uh, pandemics? Yeah. And um, yeah. Most, of them, most of them, they have a feeling that uh, it was uh, uh, really blown up out yeah. of proportion. Oh. Mm. I mean, of oh. course, they live in the part which is a little bit more isolated than maybe somebody else. Yeah. But still, I remember that one of them, he told me, maybe we will never know what was it all about. You know, uh, uh, mm. It was almost philosophical, I guess. Uh, that's very interesting. That's really interesting. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny. And, uh, I, wanted also, I wanted also to ask you, I don't know how it was in France, but uh, uh, in these Balkan countries, uh, during the American elections, it was... Uh, almost all of the time on the TV, 
and uh, a lot of the a lot of the TV stations they transmitted live the American uh, elections. You know, really which was, uh, incredible. It's it's really funny because uh, 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 amazing. Yeah, you know, I think that uh, uh, after the if you set aside the the um, terrorist attacks and uh, and wars. Uh, the last time that uh, there was so much time in the media was uh, in 1969 during the landing on the moon, you know. <laughs> wow. Incredible. And uh, you had all the time, you had uh, 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 a lot of commentary on what is going on in, in U.S. and huh. stuff. I mean, uh, it's still another country. It's uh, it's uh, out of our situation. And, Incredible. Uh, why, why are they so interested in the American election? Well, what's it about? I, I don't understand, really. <laughs> I think, you know, in the small countries, they, they, want to, uh, they, they think that they can gain something from the states, you know, that they can yeah. be helped or something really? like that. Yes, yes. So wow. it's, it's really a part of their, uh, um, of the way that... It's got something uh, to do with the worldwide media corporations and the... And the influence that they have worldwide this so you have american media corporations that can send their their news to the rest of the world and you know i don't know if a small country like serbia or any of croatia any of these kind of countries have anything like comparative where they can project their news far and wide over the world who cares who cares what's going on in serbia unless you know there are people killing each other or there's some big attack going on some big military thing or something or big massive upheaval and lots of people getting killed and nobody cares about what goes on there the elections i'm sure the average american has no idea what goes on in serbia or uh, croatia or even where those countries are they don't even know where they are let alone what goes on in them. So it's, so it's very uneven, very unequal that way. The American thing, media is so powerful, so powerful. No, people have no idea how, how influential and powerful it is. No idea. Yeah, yeah. And um, tell me, I was also meaning to ask you about uh, uh, what is your opinion on, on, uh, on comics uh, scene at this moment? Because, uh, uh, for example, I would very often asked by, I was very often asked by the journalist, uh, by the journalist, what is going on with comics? Because uh, now with uh, this uh, uh, digitalization, uh, less and less people are buying books. So, yeah. what's your opinion on this? Yeah, well, I don't follow. I don't follow that closely. What goes on? But I, I, tr I'm still interested in looking at comics. So. I try and get people to send me comics by younger people and stuff, you know, and, and new people. And there's oh, there's still good stuff coming out, and you know, you, I'm always happy to see some good comics by some younger people. But then there's like a, a kind of a thing happening in among these younger comics people that is all tied up with this gender politics and all that stuff, and the, and extreme. Uh, political correctness and stuff. There's a thing in America called the Small Press Expo, and they have a convention every year or something like that. And I, I heard like that they had this one last year where they somebody got up and just were putting me down, putting my work down, and everybody cheered, and then they they, they were booing me and everything. And and Carol Tyler, another American cartoonist, like an older one, like closer to my age, nice, does nice work. And she got up and tried to defend me and they just shouted her down, these young people involved in the, in the you know, a, a kind of a new stage of the comic scene that I have very little to do with, you know? And that they're so touchy and sensitive about all the gender stuff, you know, the gay thing, the transvestite thing, the, the uh, you know, the pro, pro, using the proper pronouns, you know, what that's about if you call somebody he or she or it or they or them or what do you call them? And they're very sensitive about all that. And, uh, you know, Phoebe Gleckner, you know her work? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great. Remember, yeah. 
just well, tops, you know, she's right up there at the top as far as I'm concerned. Now she's like in her 50s or so. She's, you know, getting older, but she's teaching comics somewhere in, in the United States, in Michigan, I think, in the upper Midwest, some college. And they, now this year, she said they started right away on her. As soon as the, the school year started and the kids came in, they started giving her a really hard time. And they, she, trying to show them some of my works, an example of good comics. And they, they looked me up on the internet and they saw the bad stuff I did about sex and these racist images. And they came back to her and they told her that she should have trigger warned them, trigger warned, that they were triggered. And that they went and they complained to the administration about her. She was called up before the administration of this school and they to, for questioning about what she was doing and what, you know, and told to, you know, uh, be careful with the kids and don't, you know, don't trigger them and all that. <laughs> she said it was it's so awful. She just, she just really wanted to quit and disgust, you know, she was disgusted with the whole thing. Mm -hmm. I, I got to write back to her and find out what's happened with all that. Curious to know what the consequences of all that were with her. So that there's that thing that's happening, which is very strange, it's bizarre. It has every, everything to do with the internet and these kind of little networks that get going on the internet and all that. Somehow it's deeply involved with that. There's a lot of, a lot of angry put downs of me and my work on the internet, calling me a sexual predator and you know, that my work is rapey. <laughs> my work is rapey. <laughs> So that's that. I don't know. I don't know where that where all that's going. You got that on the one side, and on the other side, you got this crazy right wing people in America, like the Proud Boys or the the, the Boogaloo people that, that just you know are armed to the teeth with military weapons. And, you know, that's on the other side. I don't know. I don't know where all that's going. And uh, tell me, you told me that. Uh, at these times you you more play your music than you draw. Uh, yeah, great. Can, can you say a little bit about your passion for the old uh, records? How big <laughs> is your collection? <laughs> I don't know. I just don't, I since I was young, it must be a neurological thing. I was always attracted to old music. I didn't like modern contemporary music, even even in the. 50s and 60s very very much i like to i liked a little bit of rock and roll but i was very strongly attracted to really old music which when i was a kid you only heard it in old movies on tv it's the only place you could hear old music there was nobody playing it live anymore that i ever heard so then i then i discovered it on these old 78s on the old records from the 20s and 30s that this old music wow there it is okay so i <clears throat> it came completely hooked on collecting his old records, and I still collect them. Like I told you, now I've got, you know, my connection in Serbia sending me old, nice old Serbian records. They're great. Those old string bands from Serbian accordion players are great, wonderful. The Chichi Varic band or Varic, Chichi Varic, great band. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And uh, uh, you told me a long time ago, it was maybe in the early 90s or something. That uh, you have some, you had some knowledge of the Balkan music, uh, which uh, uh, which was actually connected with uh, the music which was uh, recorded in the American um, American radio stations, and uh, yeah. uh, so how did you get that kind of esoteric material? How did it was records? Oh, it was records. Yeah. Okay. Actually, that was like some guy in Paris had them. I found them in Paris. They were on these labels from post-war Yugoslavia on the Yugotone label. Oh yeah, wonderful! They were old-time radio music, yeah, mm. Serbian radio from the. But I guess they're originally from the '30s or something like that. But they were they were like radio transcriptions. Okay, okay, yeah. If it's Yugotone, it's probably from the after-war uh, period. You sent me some information about this one, I think it was a violin player, fiddle player, that, that is, is on a couple of those Yugo Tone records and, and that he was killed at some point in the war or something like that. Or maybe after the war, I forget what you told me. 
I have it all. I saved all my information. I have it somewhere. My files. And I also wanted to 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 show you what I have found uh, on the on the flea market just oh, five, yeah? oh. five days ago. I don't know if you can see. Hold it still. Whoa! <laughs> see, it's like a bear uh, yeah. smoking a pipe. Great. That's original, huh? It's original. Yes. Uh -oh. It's Whoa. a nice drawing, yeah. and uh, uh, it was probably it was either an professional illustration from uh, from the children book yeah or, or it's maybe the work of the inspired uh, uh -huh. amateur is it signed it's uh there it's it says just m m s uh, huh. wow. so it's just the initials amazing i don't know who could do it huh. but it's, it's great i i i i bought it for less than two two euros yeah <laughs> Are you I'm still finding any, any good music photos? You still finding oh, those? Yes. Yes. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, it's still possible to find uh, some music uh, photos, and I keep them for you. I know that uh, you have special interest. Oh yeah, love those. You sent me some great ones, great mm -hmm. music photos, just from weddings and stuff like that. Snapshots of people at weddings are great. Tell me, do, do you have uh, collections of uh, stuff, stuff like that, uh, like uh, uh, drawings and stuff from the flea markets? Do not you drawing them? so much, not drawing so much, but photos, always, always looking for photos, but it's become almost impossible to find photos like that here or in America because there's a lot of people collect them. You know, any, any music related photos like that, old time, people playing, sitting around playing instruments or bands, it's really hard to find here. Once in a while it turns up that I find pictures here of old time accordion players still, you know, once in a while, or musette players, but <clears throat> yeah. I have a lot, of, a lot of old photos of musicians from all over, mostly unknown, you know, unknown musicians, don't know who they are. It's always interesting to see these photos because they ra radiate with some kind of interesting energy, I guess. Yeah, yeah, it's, that's, you know, that's real life, <laughs> you know, re that's history right there, you know, snapshots. Okay. It's always interesting, always. And uh, I, I will ask you now if you would like to play us uh, a, a little bit some music. Well, just so happens I brought my ukulele. Okay. Thank you. That's and uh, I have some I have some questions from from the viewers. Okay. Uh, first, uh, there's one from Vienna. It's uh, Ivan Petrovic, and uh, he asked you, uh, "What do you think about uh, undergroundish comics culture in Europe nowadays?" Well, I really don't know much about it. Don't see very much from it. I don't I don't get them very often, don't see, see these underground comics from Europe very much. Got it. Once in a while I get one, generally, as with the American ones, generally they're not that great. But once in a while there's something real interesting, once in a while. 
you know, but say twenty percent of it is interesting, you know. As always, it's always been that way in comics. Even in the straight comics, you know, back in the forties and fifties, maybe ten, twenty percent was interesting. And and in the heyday of underground comics, about the same, maybe ten, twenty percent, you know. <laughs> Yeah, a, lot, a lot of people uh, do a lot of different stuff, so you can always find something of interest, I guess. Yeah, that's right. I always look. If, you know, if, I, if I get stuff, I look. Look at it look for interesting stuff. And there's one question uh, by Gerhard Forster from Germany. Uh, he said, uh, I, enjoy in, I enjoyed Laundry Comics very much. It seems that Eileen and you were great uh, parents and that you always had a great culture of discussing and dealing with conflicts, something that seems more and more to disappear. To, uh, avo to avoid conflicts and uh, not act them out can make a human being sick. So do you see yourself as a narrator of conflicts, as an instru instructor of conflicts, inner ones and in general? <laughs> instructor about conflict? Not really, but you know, I guess that when we, Aileen and I did those comics together, it was uh, it was kind of to a certain way therapeutic for us, you know. <laughs> and uh, we kind of knew we were sort of conscious that we were reflecting on into the world, you know, issues that people should talk about, you know, be open about. Kind of, we sort of understood that we were sort of conscious of that, you know. At the same time, you always just want to be entertaining and funny and get, get laughs, you know. So, it's like doing stand-up comedy, you know. A guy stands in front of a crowd and tells jokes. You know, there's a lot of ways you can do that. There's a way you just tell cheap jokes and they're, you know, throwaway jokes. Or you can kind of talk about yourself and your own neurosis and people can identify with that and it makes them feel better. So, you know, that's kind of what Aileen and I sort of do, you know, by displaying our own neurosis and being funny about it. It kind of takes the tension off of it for other people. And that's, so that's kind of, we're sort of conscious of doing that, you know. And uh, there's a question by Nikola Ozelot, and he asks... Uh, Where's he from? Uh, I, I'm not sure, probably from Croatia or from yeah. Serbia. And uh, the question is, uh, what do you fear most in the world? What do I fear most? Yes. What keeps me up at night? What makes me wake up in the middle of the night scared? <laughs> yeah. Well, let's see. I'm afraid of a lot of things. I'm a, I'm a fraidy cat. I'm a fearful person. <laughs> you know, I fear eruptions of brutal collective violence. You know, if enough people get scared, then they get, they get angry and they want to take up arms against some perceived enemy, somebody that's a threat to them. It's, that worries me, you know, that people will panic and become violent and collectively like they did in the 30s and 40s you know or what happened in in, in yugoslavia in the 90s and the early 2000s oh awful you know you worry about that people taking up violence because sometimes that's the only solutions people can see is violence so worry about that one thing i don't worry about is the fucking covid 19 i don't worry about that very much i don't worry about attack attacks from germs i just don't that's not a big big on my list of things to worry about you know Cl climate change uh, yeah maybe maybe that's something to worry about you know yeah you know when it doesn't rain for long periods of time i think ooh, is this it you know is this it is it going to end up like the whole country burning up like what happened in california you know is that going to happen here you know, stuff like that. And I, of course, worry, every day worries about my grandchildren, you know, whether, what kind of world are they going to grow up in, you know, worry about that a little bit, worry about that. But, you know, I have to, I'm old, I have to deal with, with death, impending death, you know, think about that. But as you get older, I find you, get, you would kind of adjust to the fact that your life is not, you know, you're nearing the end of your life. You kind of adjust to it. I remember in my 60s or 50s even, I would have these moments of panic. Oh, my God, I'm getting old. <gasps> oh, my God. 
but now you, you sort of you you adapt to the idea that your 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 little precious self is going to end. Actually, it's gonna there's an end to it, and you know, maybe that's a good thing. Yeah, it's not that all bad, you know. <laughs> Get tired of yourself. <laughs> Then there's a, a, a question by Pat Moriarty. He asked. Uh, Pat Moriarty? Did you say yeah, Pat yeah, yeah. Moriarty? Okay, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he asked about uh, Mindshaft, if you can say a few words about your contribution. Mindshaft? Yeah. Huh. Yeah. That's a Mindshaft, great little magazine. It's great little magazine. I hope they can keep putting it out. I hope that they can keep going with it. Although, you know, it's. If it becomes a burden to them, I guess they should stop because there's no money in it. You know, it's just a labor of love completely. But oh yeah, it's a great little zine. You know, I'm happy to contribute to it. You know. Yeah, it's it's interesting that you are now publishing uh, to some of the greatest uh, magazines like New Yorker, but at the same time you also do some contribution to 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 a fanzine. Right. Right. Well, it actually is. You know, less restrictions in Mindshaft than there is in the New Yorker. <laughs> New Yorker, you know, there's quite a few restrictions. And uh, I actually don't work for the New Yorker anymore, though. Stop working with them. I got, they, I, you know, being sort of prima donna, I was really pissed off when they rejected this cover idea. <laughs> that was it for me with them. <laughs> Then there's a question uh, by Emir uh, Pashanovic, I guess, from Croatia. He asked you, uh, Mr. Crump, did you learn any French? Not very much. I've been here 30 years. It's an embarrassment. I still barely speak the language and barely understand when they talk. I, it's, I just, I don't know. It's just, I can't penetrate the French language. I, Aileen, my wife, she's very, quite fluent, you know. So if somebody calls up and the, on the phone and starts going in French, I just say, Aileen, Aileen, say here, somebody's talking French, here, take the phone. <laughs> it's embarrassing, but, you know, there it is. And there's another psychological question by Ivan Indir, I, I guess from Croatia. And uh, he asked you, uh, what uh, would be the best advice you would give to your younger self? Also an advice you think is relevant for young people today? Advice for young people? Yeah. <laughs> Get off the fucking internet. <laughs> <laughs> how about, how about the, the young crumb? What would you say to him? <clears throat> it's all rhetorical. It's talking to your younger self, you know. It's all rhetorical. Of course, you know, it's... I did lots of stupid things, made lots of stupid mistakes, and thought I knew everything, and of course I didn't, you know, I didn't know as much as I thought I knew. But I would say, I would have probably should have not smoked so much pot. I should have smoked less pot when I was young. Smoked too much marijuana in uh, the years of, from about 68 to about 74, I smoked too much marijuana. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, here's the question by Vladimir Palibrk. He lives in, in Paris, but he's originally from Serbia. Wow. And he, he asked you about uh, five, your favorite five movies of all time. Favorite five movies? Yes. Well, I don't know. That's really hard because, you know, there's like several Laurel and Hardy episodes that I love. They're great. They're wonderful. And then there's some great Three Stooges episodes. <laughs> you know, how do you, can you pick five of those? No, there's, there's too many good ones. And then there's these, there's the old movies of the 30s. Then there's some contemporary movies of the last 20 years. And I'd say contemporary movies, I liked uh, uh, Amadeus, about that thing about uh, Mozart. You ever see that, Amadeus? Oh, yeah, yeah. Great movie, great movie. Chinatown was a great movie with Jack Nicholson, great movie. Uh, Goodfellas was a great movie. Uh, I don't know. Yeah. And uh, here's the question by Cornell from, from Croatia. He, he asked, uh, uh, your daughter Sophie is a comic author. Can you say something about uh, 
your relation uh, and uh, her comic art? Sophie was a great artist. She was a great artist. I kind of say was. She's still done doing a little bit of drawing, but now she has three kids, three small children, and she's the mom. Impossible to do almost anything else except, you know, uh, take care of those kids and knit some socks. You know, she's, she's turned into a great knitter. She makes, you know, sweaters and socks for the kids. I'm wearing some socks she made for me right now. They're great. They're wonderful. <laughs> But she doesn't draw so much, but she turned out to be a great artist, uh, superior to me in many ways. And, and she just kind of had to let it go with those three kids. Uh, she'll probably get back to it as the kids grow older, you know, as the kids become more self-contained uh, and independent. She'll, she'll probably, I think she'll go back to it. But, you know, Sophie, anything she does, she takes on with her hands. She's got just great hand skills. She's also a really fine musician. She's a really good, way superior to me on the piano. Really, way more advanced than me. She did, she's has really powerful musical ability, as well as drawing ability. She's got both those things going. She kind of got the best of me and Aileen, and thankfully not the worst. <laughs> Cornel, he, he also asked, uh, what was the last 78 record you bought? Last record I bought? Yeah. Well, I recently got some great 78s in trade from a guy in Serbia. <laughs> you know, I do a little drawing for him. He sends me great 78s from that region of the world, which are impossible to find anywhere else. They're only distributed there. And there was a recording studio in Zagreb in the 20s and 30s by this company Edison Bell had a recording studio there and put out local records from that region that are really fine records from that period, from the 20s and 30s. And there was other, you know, big companies like Odeon was there, German companies. Uh, Pathé was there, a big French company. And they, they recorded local stuff string bands, bagpipe players, accordion guys, some of it's really crazy wacky. You should listen to it and think, wow, those crazy Serbians. <laughs> They're crazier than the Croatians. <laughs> Croatians are a little more tame, the music's a little more tame. The Serbian stuff gets really wild in those old records, really wild. You know, there's a kind of, uh, sort of a little bit of gypsy element in it, sounds like, I don't know, I'm not sure. Not sure. Uh, probably because the gypsies were the people who were uh, actually playing this old music, so they they were the ones who who, who were bringing this uh, tradition to the to the masses. Yeah, that's probably true. Yeah, you're probably right. It was true in many places, actually. Yeah. Then you have the question by Ivan Bucni Svagusa Stripoi. That's his name. Uh, he said, "Greetings from Split Croatia. I have a." Question for you regarding European comics. How do you see European comics versus American ones? And what do you think about authors like uh, Joan Spara and Trondheim? I like Trondheim, okay. I have a problem because of language barrier with those comics. So it's kind of hard to read some of it, you know? And so just, just looking at the pictures often when there's a language problem, you know? So. Uh, I'm still mostly tuned into American comics, mostly. You know, this, not as tuned into the European stuff. I'm not kind of not in the network with it, you know. I'm not uh, connected to it too much. I see some stuff. There's a, once in a while, there's something good. You know, like I said before, it's, you know, maybe 10%, 20% of it's interesting. As, as with the American stuff, 80% of it's not so interesting. You know, they, they, they can't tell a good story, they can't draw well, or, or both, or, you know. Sometimes they can, they have interesting drawing styles, but they don't have a good storyline, you know. It's, as you know, you know, it's, it's rare to have people that are, have those things in combination, can tell a good story and draw well, or even draw interesting, that's, you even have to draw well, but you can just draw, make an interesting drawing, you know. Yeah. It's unusual. It's rare, actually. It's a rare talent. There's, there's a, a question by Zoran Jukanovic. He's from Serbia, living in Amsterdam. Uh, 
were there any critics of your work who later after the detailed analysis changed their minds and admitted that there was no misogyny at all in your work so it's like yeah. a question about uh, uh, political correctness and stuff yeah like well all i can t all i know about that is that a couple of times i've heard from people who said when they first saw my work when they were young they were very offended by it and then they kind of got past that as they matured and then saw what it was about, you know, as they matured. But then there's like ones who just are, didn't like it and never will like it. They just, they had to come from a different sensibility, you know, they just, they just don't get it and they never will. There's, there's, there's that, you know, and, and okay, you know, I can accept that. It's like, when I drew the stuff, I certainly expected to have mass popularity. It wasn't, wasn't my dream was to have like a mass audience, like, uh, you know, uh, Asterix or something. I just didn't, didn't think that way about it. Yeah. And uh, there's another uh, interesting uh, uh, question. It's uh, from a monk from Serbia, from the Serbian Orthodox Monastery. Holy wow, Jesus. <laughs> wow. He asked you about uh, uh, Genesis. Uh, was it uh, uh, connected with the spiritual experience uh, for you? No, but my, I have a question for him. What the hell is he doing w watching something like this in a monastery? <laughs> they allow that? They allow these guys to go in, in their little cells with, the, with their laptops and just sit there and look at stuff on the internet all day? <laughs> they allow that in a monastery? <laughs> see, if he comes, see if he answers that. <laughs> yeah. Well, my guess is that uh, there are different people in the, in the monasteries. So some of them, they, they uh, are following what, what is going on in the, in the outside world, outside mm -hmm. of the cell. So that's mm -hmm. my guess. Uh. And uh, there's a question by Alex Neal. He asked, uh, how can the cartoonists uh, send you their comics? How can they send me their comics? Yes. Uh, well, I kind of reluctant to give my address out on this thing, but um, send them to uh, to there's maybe we can say that uh, they can send uh, they can send it to to Mochora. They will be able to find this on the uh, or they can send it to that 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 R Crumb website in the United States. It's okay. written by Alex Wood. Alexander Wood, it's called, I forget what it's called, rcrum.com or something like that. Send it to him and he'll send it to me. Okay, okay. And uh, a question uh, by Leonard. He asked, are there any other outcasts you identify with other than uh, country blues, uh, jazz folk legends? Other, other than what? Other outcasts. Yeah. Or my guess is uh, that he wanted to ask, uh, do you identify with some other rebellious people outside of the blues or country tradition? <clears throat> There's certain writers who are, that I like that I identify with, like Charles Bukowski or even Kafka, you know, that was sort of that way, sort of outcast type. Bukowski, very alienated guy. <laughs> <clears throat> I tend to identify with the alienated types, yeah. But. Then there's a question by Dragan Šašić, I guess from Serbia. Uh, can you recommend some of your favorite uh, comics? Favorite, like old comics or contemporary comics or what? Yeah, I guess uh, anytime. Well, I'm a huge fan still of Karl Barks and Donald Duck. Those, the stories he did in the 40s and early 50s. They're great. It's all great. I go, I read them to my grandkids sometimes, and they hold up really well. Those Karl Barks stories. I see even more in them now than I did when I was younger. There's a lot going on in those. A lot of subtle stuff going on in those. They're great. Karl Barks, Donald Duck. Uh, I don't know. Some of the stuff I like is the old, really old comic strip stuff like Popeye. That's 
you know, you have to find these books of these reprints of that stuff, you know, old American stuff. And uh, I, I don't know, if you're talking about more kind of alternative comics, then you're talking about people like you, uh, Joe Sacco, uh, Dan Klaus, Phoebe Glickner, Aileen Kaminsky, uh, Carol Tyler, uh, Julie Doucet, Peter Bagg, I don't know, there's it, a whole end list of people. That are, Justin Green, of course, is up at the top. You find his comics. They're hard to find, Justin Green stuff. And, you know, he did lots of little short two, three, four page pieces in the 70s that have never been reprinted anywhere. And they're great. They're all tops, all his stuff. There's a question by Danilo Lazaric from Serbia. Uh, he asked, is there maybe a book that uh, you would like to illustrate sort of uh, what you did with uh, Genesis? <clears throat> well, I had this plan to illustrate My Secret Life, which was the secret sex diaries of this wealthy upper class Englishman in the 19th century, he kept these diaries. And he, then he published them when he was old, he published them privately. And then in the 60s, they got published for, by a big publisher, Penguin or something like that. And they're great. The writing's great, the images, the stories are so rich. He's just this obsessed guy, sexually obsessed, that went around hitting on women constantly. All, of all social classes. He, and he also went to prostitutes and he describes it all richly in, his, in these diaries that he published. And when Penguin published the complete thing in the 60s, it's like three volumes like they're this thick of these things. It's, and it's, it's not even that repetitious, it's rich stuff. So I was thinking of selecting you know, my, the most um, interesting stories of, that affected me and doing a comic of that, but it's so demanding that, that to get it authentic and to look right, you know, the costumes of the time and all that stuff, it's, it's a big job. Big job. I'm, not, I'm not sure I'm up for a big job like that anymore. <laughs> I don't know. <clears throat> There's a question by Mihovil Jordan, I guess from Croatia. Has, uh, uh, have you crossed your pet uh, in past with the late Harlan Ellison? No, I never did. Never met Harlan Ellison. I know who he is, but I never met him, no. Mm -hmm. I was then not there, around science fiction stuff. Uh -huh. Then there's a question by, uh, from Denver, uh, Colorado, by K Keith West. Uh, are you going to uh, revisit any of your old characters again, like Mr. Natural and uh, Bobo Bolinsky? <laughs> nah, probably not. Probably not. I think that's over. <laughs> I think that that uh, oeuvre, that bunch of work, it has to stand as it is. <laughs> then there's a question from Italy by Andrea Plazzi. Uh, he asked uh, uh, more generally, what uh, what's Mr. Crumb grasp, grasp or view of Europe after so many years he's been spending over here? What do you think about Europe? What I think about Europe? Yeah. Or the life in, in Europe in general? Well, I don't know much about what goes on in other countries besides France. I haven't spent that much time in other countries. Only been through Italy very briefly. Went to a comic festival there a few years ago. Liked Serbia. Thought Serbia was great. I liked it there. I, was, I thought I could live here. I could live in Serbia. And then people told me, yeah, it's really cheap to live there and stuff. So, I thought I could live there. It was nice. I liked it. And I like the fact that a lot of people there were existential and, and depressed and, and serious. I like that. I like that. And you, you should also try uh, uh, to visit Croatia. I think it's, uh, it's a great place. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and there's a question by Alex Neal. Uh, what do you ink uh, these days? Do you do something in ink? What do I do in ink? Yes. I do. Well, anything I do for pretty much for finished art has, is involves doing involves ink. 
<laughs> pens and ink, you know, and brushes and stuff, antique art supplies, paper, pens, ink, <laughs> and whiteout. Use lots of whiteout. <laughs> and here's a question by uh, Ethan Storley. Uh, did you ever get uh, to talk to Rory Heiss in person before he passed? Did you sure. know? Yeah, he was. A, he, I was in quite friendly terms with him. You know, I saw him quite frequently in the early '70s and hung out with him. Very, very odd little guy. Very strange little guy, but very innocent and just seemed like he uh, was always seemed like he just newly arrived in the world. Like he was still wet behind the ears. You know, he just always seemed like that. So it was a kind of a wide-eyed. Innocence, but obviously he had something wacky and psycho going on inside of him, which was hard to hard to read. And then he overdosed on drugs. Died of, died of overdose. Yeah. And uh, there's a question from Montenegro. Uh, have you seen uh, American Splendor, and what do you think about it? Have I seen it? Yeah, yeah, I, work, yeah. I did work in. I mean, the movie. Did you talk about the movie? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was pretty good. It was pretty good. It was funny because they they would switch from these actors playing Harvey Pekar and his wife Joyce to showing the real Harvey Pekar and Joyce. That was kind of funny. And I guess Harvey participated in the making of the film enough to make them stick to the the real stuff so they didn't drift too far away from it and i thought that the actor who played harvey was pretty good it's paul giamatti or something like that Gio, i forget his name he was pretty good and the woman who played joyce was good too hope davis and she was much cuter than the real joyce <laughs> that was good yeah there, there's a question by dan chancharic from serbia um did you ever met, meet uh, John Fante? No, never met John Fante. No, I've read his stuff. I like his stuff. Good. So he's almost up there with Bukowski. So he's good. Bukowski admired Fante. That's how the only way that any, everybody got onto Fante was because Bukowski said he liked him. Does this guy like Bukowski also? This guy they asked about Fante. Does he like Bukowski? Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, and the last question uh, by Ivan Kovacevic. Uh, do, did you change your opinion on Fritz, uh, Fritz the Cat cartoon by Bakshi? Did I change my opinion? Yeah. No, I still don't like it. <laughs> I still think it was a, uh, not in, in the, too far removed from the spirit that, it, that I had originally done it in. I, I shouldn't have let those guys do it. That's one thing I regret from my youth, is I let those guys do that film. I should have insisted, no, I should have stuck to my guns. But, but I was young, and they were very aggressive and, and very fast-talking New York media guys, and they just rolled over me. So I was 25. What the hell would I know? You know I'm dealing with those kind of guys. Okay, Robert, uh, thanks a lot for, for sure. your... Uh, company and for talking to, to, to our viewers. Okay, it's nice to see you again, too. That, that's a pleasure. <laughs> Bye. Au revoir. Hey, you just go and say it's hard to home. Okay, time to go home. Au revoir, ski.